some of you will come forward and want to share with us. We're going to ask you to prepare a 30-minute sermon. You're not a preacher. I am, okay? That's what I do. That's my job. That's what I do. But we would like to hear from you from time to time if you want to just tell what God has done for you, if God laid something on your heart. God has laid something on Kelly's heart tonight. So what I ask is uh, while she speaks, give her your attention. Uh, listen to what she's got to say for us. Hear what she's got to say and see how it applies uh, to your life. Probably can't, but we'll speak first. 
tell me what chances you have against me. Does it please you to repress you, to spend the work of your hands, while you smile and seem as the wicked? Do you have eyes of flesh? Do you see the mortal seed? Or are the days like those of the mortal, of your years of those of the man? That you must search out my thoughts and proceed after my sin. That you know that I am guilty, and that no one can rest me from your hand. Listen to this. Your hands shaped me and they made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that I molded you like you molded me like clay. Will you now turn to me again just like dust? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Clothe me with the skins of flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. You gave me life and showed me kindness, and in his providence, watch over my spirit. But this is what you instill in your heart, and I know this is what is in your mind. If I sin, you would be if I sin, you would be watching me, and would not let me offend, go and punish. If I'm guilty, woe to me. Even if I'm innocent, I cannot lift my head, for I'm full of shame. I drown in my afflictions, if I hold my head high. You stop me like a lion and again display your awesomeness, power against me. You bring new witnesses against me and increase your anger towards me. You force me to come against me a wave upon wave. Why didn't you bring me out of your wings? I wish I'd died before my eyes saw this. If only I had never came into being or had been carried straight from the womb to the grave. Are not my few days almost over turned away from me? So I can, at the moment's joy, before I know the place of no return, to the land of gloom and to the deep of shadow, to the land of the deepest night of the deep shadow and disorder, where even the light gives into the white darkness. That just talks about like that whole verse just talks about like the frustration of Job, and that it was a false conclusion about God was out to get him the whole entire time. Have you ever felt like God, you're out to get me? God, you do not have a plan for me, but you are out to get me. Because I will be the first one to raise my hand. I'm not ashamed of it. I've lived with it, and Satan comes in and knocks me down every time. And then I build myself back up and then knock me down every time. But this is an amazing part. It says, I have a little study note in a part of my Bible, and this is where you know, a lot of my information is what I need or what I want to know. And this is what it says. He says, we dare not to take our limited experience and jump into the conclusions about life in general. If you find yourself doubting God, remember that you don't have all the facts. God wants only the very best for your life. Many people endure great pain. But ultimately, they find some greater good come from it. When you're struggling, don't assume the worst. When it's in the lowest valley, you say, God, why am I here? What's your plan for me?
is that God then adopted us into his family. That's good stuff. That, my friend, is what mercy is all about. And we worship God because of that. That's why we worship, not because God gives us everything we want, or he answers every prayer, or he lets us know the answer to every question that we have, and, and, and every, no, we don't worship God because life is easy. We worship God because we can live. We worship God because he has, has made it so that we don't have to die. He says to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what we have to do. That's our part of it, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. These people knew what sacrifices were. They lived in a culture of sacrifice. They took animals, the finest animals they had. They killed them. They put them on an altar. This was the way these people worshipped. I'm really glad Jesus came along because that's disgusting to me. All right? But that's how they worshipped. Thing, whether it be making posters and hanging them on the wall so more people come, the best that 
I have to offer has to go for God. We've got to lay it on an altar for God. That's our living sacrifice. It's the best that we have. That's what we were formed to do. Is to worship Him and to give our lives for Him. Worship does not start when you walk into a worship service. It's a continuation of what we should have already been doing. One thing that you're going to have to look at, all right? When I start talking about change and, 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 and what does this total sacrifice mean, one thing you need to look at is your relationships. Okay? That's in every age of your life, especially and particularly right now. Because the relationships I formed when I were here, I love those people to death, but they took me to hell with them. They took a kid that had been led to heaven. You've heard my story. I knew right from wrong. But they took a kid that had been raised up and pointed toward heaven and drove him straight to hell with them. You need to look at the relationships that you're forming right now. And not just your friends. Think about this. About your parents. How's your relationship with your parents? Are you how do you talk to your parents? Do you do you do you do you is your relationship with them God honoring? Do you remember? Children honor your father and your mother. That's important. Some of us may have issues <laughs> with our parents. I told you I had an issue with my mom for many years. Karen has been open about her relationship with her father. We have to be willing to change that. We honor our parents. What about your, what about your dating relationships? That's really important. Are you dating somebody that, that, that uh, you know, are, are they committed followers of Jesus? Are they helping you become better worshipers? Or are they molding you opposite of what God molded you to be? You need to look at that too. Second Chronicles chapter 6 says, Do not be unequal to yoke. somebody that's not a believer. Now I'm not just talking about believing. I'm talking about somebody that you've got a spiritual connection with God to. Stop people on words. You can get married. They've married your whole life. But it's going to be hard. There's going to be battles that you're going to fight. You're going to butt heads. Uh, there's a lady in my church. She's grown up. She has, she's been in, in the church that I, that, at the church I pastor. She's been in that church her whole life. She's been married for 20 something years. Her husband's never come to church for her. And it's a battle that she cries about often. And she's been married a long time. They have a good relationship, but it hurts her. So you need to look at the people you're dating. You think right now, well, the person I'm dating right now, whatever, I'm in junior college. I'm married to the person I was dating in junior college. The only reason we're still married is because we got together and said, this ain't working. And we got on our knees and we got together with God and it saved our marriage. So it's important that you do that. Do the things of your life, do they cause you to be a better worshiper? Do they cause you to be the, the, the worshiper that you were formed to be, that you were molded to be? I want us to take just a second. Brian, I don't know if you've got something to play, uh, some, some music or something, but what I want us to do, Lamentations 3.40, Jeremiah writes, to let us examine our ways and test them, let us return to the Lord. So I want us to take just a second, just some music. Let's just be still, let's just be silent before God and look at how the worship service of your life is going and, and, and let's commit to putting every area of our life on an altar of worship Paul tells them in Romans 12 verse 2 he tells them to not be conformed to this world but to be transformed that means change by the renewing of your mind. Everybody wants to know what God's will for their life is, don't they? Everybody wants to know 
what they're supposed to be doing for God, I can tell you, it can only be found if you become a worshiper. That's the only way you're going to know it. So why do we worship? Because God has shown mercy to us. God's will is that you become a part of his family. He gave his son so that he could be reunited. So Aaron's going to play us a song. And I want you just to take a second. Doesn't have to be long and drawn out. Let's just take a second and let's think about our lives. Let's look at our lives and let's see if we are being what we were formed to be. And if we're not, let's allow ourselves to be molded and formed even closer to his likeness uh, at this time tonight. If you want to kneel at your seat, kneel at